um, I'll just say good afternoon to everyone and welcome you all um, officially to this webinar um, around the kernel mental health in the first 2000 days. Um, we are recording this meeting um, so that we can make it available to colleagues that are not able to join us um, at this time. Um, I, I would first of all like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're all meeting today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, and we're on all various lands and myself, I'm in Lake Macquarie, the home of a Wabakal people. So it's going to give it gives me a really great pleasure um, to introduce Elizabeth Murphy. Um, Elizabeth is the senior clinical advisor at the Child and Family Health um, Health and Social Policy Branch at the Ministry. And um, I've heard Elizabeth um, speak about maternal mental health in the first two thousand days, and um, really look forward um, to hearing this afternoon's presentation. So welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you, um, Maria, for the invitation, and thank you to everybody who is uh, giving up their precious time to um, be with me now for the next uh, 60 minutes. And um, I love what we're about to talk about, and I hope that um, I'll be able to share that interest to you as well, um, in particular in this context of maternal mental health. So I will be doing it from the focus of the first 2,000 days of life, from conception to the age of five. And in that context, we've almost doubled life expectancy over the last century. So a century ago, the expectation was that people would live just over 17,000 days, and this has almost doubled to 30,000 days. So the point is that the first 2,000 days, so Marie, is there a problem? Yeah. Um, and, and so I've reassured her, I can't see any of the issues other than... Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, there's, so the point is that the first 2,000 days are going to be the most important for the following 28,000 days. So that's what I hope I'll be able to uh, convince you of during this presentation. Um, tragically, the, this is not true for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children who are expected to live less. And that is why the closing the gap processes and everything that we need to do is so important for those children. So we're going to focus on the first 2000 days that's from conception to the age of entry to school. And why it's important is because that's when 90% of a child's brain is developing. So what we want to do is to build that brain to be the best that it can be, to give the best opportunity for every child. And the knowledge that we've got now from this increasing new evidence is really giving us a much greater opportunity to be able to offer to every child the best that they can be supported by their best brain development. Now, in the medical literature, you will see more likely um, focus on the first 1,000 days rather than 2,000 days. Um, at the ministry, when we were doing this work, we decided that we would go to 2,000 days, to the age of five. And whilst it is true that the bulk of brain development is happening in that first 1,000 days, we thought that it was important to include the opportunity for intervention because those following years after the first 1,000 days, those are really great times for us to be able to still intervene, still good brain plasticity. And of course, one of the most important interventions for brain development is the opportunity for preschool prior to school entry. So the hours from the age of four at preschool, we know has good evidence um, that that's important for brain development. So that's why we made the decision to go for the first 2000 days. And that was a very good decision because it meant that we have naturally been um, approached by our partners in Department of Education and Communities and Justice 
where uh, they have a much stronger role right up to the age of five. And indeed, uh, the Minister of the Department of Education, Sarah Mitchell, has um, moved to build on the first 2000 days to a project called Brighter Beginnings, which is an interagency project. So some of the things that we will um, be talking about um, with regard to the importance of this research uh, may affect you personally because every single one of you has had a personal first 2000 days or are responsible for children or grandchildren or nieces, nephews, friends, children. But I just want to emphasize that none of this represents individual clinical advice. All of this is based on public health in the main research. So talking about risk, not talking about destiny, and that there are many things that are part of this complex puzzle. And it's a rich tapestry that we're talking about. And ultimately there is always the human capacity for resilience. But we're going to run through this emerging evidence as to the ABCDE. We'll begin with antenatal care, then talk about brain development, one study on childhood experience, a mention about domestic violence with some data linkage and epigenetics. So let's start. So let's start where it does in the antenatal period. And we're going to talk about three aspects of what happens during that time. The physical health, then the psychosocial health, and then the future health of that baby. Now, just to talk about the physical health, I think that the correlation between the physical health of the mother impacting on the structure or physical health of the baby has been well accepted over, over many decades. Um, I still find it incredible though that something as um, as nuanced as folate, a water soluble vitamin in levels prior to conception and in the first weeks of pregnancy are going to make a difference as to whether that child has spina bifida or anencephaly, something so structurally significant in the development of that fetus based on the balance of a water soluble vitamin. Similarly, rubella, a, a very mild illness in the um, mother with significant consequences on the baby. Pretty well the only thing that could cause a child to be blind and deaf and um, intellectually handicapped. And we've had amazing uh, public health campaigns that have turned these two things around. Um, when I trained in paediatrics, we had a whole ward that was dedicated to spina bifida and now it's unlikely a medical student training today is might see a child with spina bifida. Um, rubella, we used to have schools for the, the deaf and blind, and now we don't need that anymore because that it vaccination program has made such a significant difference. However, we have a new problem with um, obesity and gestational diabetes and children being born with impaired glucose tolerance. So I just mentioned that in the context of very minor physical health determinations in the mother having significant consequences for the baby. And I do that in the context of alcohol because we know that alcohol has a particularly damaging effect to the developing fetus. In the first trimester, we know that it can affect um, facial features, cardiac development, etc. But throughout the pregnancy, it can have an impact on the brain, in particular the corpus callosum and the cerebellum. And even prenatal alcohol exposure can have an impact. Despite that knowledge, one in two women will drink in pregnancy and one in four will continue to drink in pregnancy. Once they know they're pregnant, they will continue to drink. And if you have a look at this slide on the right, the purple image represents the load of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder as a cause of developmental disability in the Western world. And that compares with 
autism spectrum, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome and Tourette's. You can see a much lower level compared with this dominant um, diagnosis now of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And yet this is the only cause of, of um, intellectual um, handicap developmental disability that is actually 100% preventable. And we have recently in Australia had um, a Senate inquiry that looks at, sorry, I'll just go to that slide, that, um, that looks at the effective approaches to prevention, diagnosis and support for fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, it is referred to as an invisible epidemic and what should be said is that there is no known safe level of alcohol that can be consumed during pregnancy. Um, a study that was undertaken on the Juvenile Justice Institution in Western Australia, there's only one uh, place that those young people would go to. Of the 88 young people that were studied, um, all of them had uh, at least one domain of severe neurodevelopment impairment, but a third were diagnosed with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So the consequences um, can be less um, in that this is a study that looked at prenatal alcohol exposure. And you can see here that it determined psychopathology, attention deficits, impulsiveness, um, and that it was a dose dependent response. So there can be subtle effects and then more extreme effects with these young people um, who end up in juvenile justice. And no doubt a significant part of that is their um, diagnosis. Um, so the NHMRC does have clear advice now uh, that not drinking is the safest option. And so this is something that we need to consider when we're looking at, at women um, who are pregnant. And then if we start thinking about what might be the reason that they uh, would be turning to alcohol, then we start to look at stress. And I'm going to layer this um, in the next section of the presentation. If you haven't looked at the RAIN study, the Western Australian Pregnancy Cohort Study, please do. It's, it's a really exciting website, if you enjoy websites as I, as I do. Um, and this is a study that um, began in Western Australia in 1989-1990 and where they looked at documenting nearly 3,000 women and many, many, many aspects of the pregnancy and then followed up the children at, at five, eight, 11 into adolescence and beyond. And one of the things that they documented was stress. So they looked at the kinds of things that can happen in life uh, but they looked at when they happened to these women during the nine months of their pregnancy. Things like moving house, which is tick one, because many women tend to do that um, during their pregnancy. But then other things like the loss of a job or the loss of a partner, um, things like that. And they documented the number of stressful events, the type of stressful events, and then the timing of those stressful events. And then in the following years, they documented with the children the child behaviour checklist and um, looked at what the risk was of that child displaying an abnormal result on that child behaviour checklist. And you can see that the risk is, is not going up substantially until a mother starts to have four or five uh, stressors during the pregnancy and you can see then that odds ratio goes up substantially that that child is going to be demonstrating abnormal results on a child behaviour checklist. And a very recent study uh, that has just been released in New Zealand confirms this and this is looking at mild to moderate stress in pregnancy having adverse outcomes on a child's neurodevelopment or executive function. 
and that will impact on how that child learns. So this is um, just across um, the ocean in New Zealand, looking at women who experienced stress or anxiety and depression, and then looked at what was the impact on that child moving forward. And they linked this to intergenerational disadvantage. And we'll be talking about this a little bit longer. So that is stress in pregnancy. And now I wanna move on to psychosocial health in pregnancy. And this is something, so before I was talking about normal life, stress happens, this is the co potential consequences for the baby. And now we're going to talk about the mother's psychosocial health and indeed the father's psychosocial health and the impact of pregnancy on that mother's psychosocial health. And you can see that that is substantial. In New South Wales, one in 10 women antenatally and one in seven postnatally will develop depression or anxiety and one in 20 dads antenatally and one in 10 dads postnatally will similarly develop depression or anxiety. In New South Wales, that means that there are 15,000 new cases of depression in women postnatally and 10,000 in fathers postnatally. So that's part of why we've been piloting um, a focus on new fathers project in four local health districts, trying to look at identifying dads who might be suffering from depression or anxiety. And that's why we have the Safe Start uh, processes antenatally and postnatally, where we are trying to do an antenatal and postnatal psychosocial assessment to identify this very substantial number um, of, of people who will be um, identifying as depressed or anxious. And the consequences are not only for them and what that impact may be for them, but the consequences will also be for the baby. And we'll talk about that a little later when we start talking about the impact on that child's potential development. And then finally, on this section, I wanted to talk about um, a study of linked data that was done in um, Denmark. And this has also been replicated in, in other um, countries. But it's looking at where a mother actually suffers clinical depression. And as we know, um, some mothers will consider that they're doing the right thing by not taking medication during pregnancy because they're worried that it might affect the baby. But clinical depression also affects the baby as this linked data study demonstrated. So they documented um, three groups of women. Uh, the red group is women who don't have depression. Uh, the blue group is women who have clinical depression but have taken their antidepressants. And the green group are the women who have clinical depression and have not taken their antidepressants. And you can see on a strengths and difficulties questionnaire on that child at the age of seven, that they will show much more abnormal results if they have actually been bathed in those toxins of depression during the time of pregnancy. So all building this picture that the mental health of the mother is going to have an impact on the mental health of that baby and child and adolescent. So it's going to have an impact for life. Um, another more recent study um, from Victoria, um, looking at those incredibly difficult babies who have problems sleeping for the first year of life. And they found um, a response to poor mental and physical health of the mother in pregnancy linked to infant sleep problems. And we know if the infants got sleep problems, the parents have got sleep problems, and then that can affect their mood as well. Now, there have been studies for a long time that have shown us um, that the stress of the mother can have an impact on the baby. And this is um, quite amazing studies that were done in the 60s 
where if you can believe it, the mother was told that she was breathing a gas which contained only half the amount of oxygen necessary to support fetal life. This is what the study did to try and make the mother stressed. I think that would make any of us stressed. And they were looking at the response to by the fetus and the fetal heart rate um, had an impact, of course, much more in babies that were vulnerable who had um, <clears throat> issues clinically. So those are studies that I don't think are done very, um, would not be done now. However, I do want to talk about some work that's happening with Catherine Posner. Um, and this is very um, incredible work that um, is looking at MRIs, infant MRIs, um, of mothers who have depression. And they have shown that if a baby has been exposed prenatally to maternal depression, that there is different neurobehavioural maturation in those babies compared to others. So now we're getting an image that this baby is actually being born with different neuro um, uh, formation, different circuitry from the prefrontal cortex to the amygdala, um, if that mother has prenatal depression. And so it's just giving us sort of the, the structural biological picture, as well as the biochemical stress image of what depression is doing to that developing baby's brain and anxiety, of course. So now we move off onto, onto um, DOHAD, Developmental Origins of Health and Disease. And basically the third part of what's happening in that antenatal period from this first 2000 days perspective is that the baby is being set, if you like, for health for the rest of their life. And the first person who had this hypothesis was a Dr. Barker. His hypothesis was actually, if a baby was born fat, was it more likely that they would have early onset of heart disease? But I want to um, make um, an acknowledgement of this midwife, um, because whilst the hypothesis is known as the Barker hypothesis, it should probably be known as the Burnside hypothesis, because without Ethel Burnside and her amazing documentation, you can see there that the midwives and nurses did extraordinary um, number of visits and documented everything, then he wouldn't have been able to do his linked data. So perhaps we should talk, call it the Barker-Burnside hypothesis, but it is known as the Barker hypothesis. And um, Dr. Barker's hypothesis was um, in the end that low birth weight would be linked to earlier onset of coronary heart disease. And when he matched up the records in Hertfordshire, indeed, that's exactly what he did um, find, that it, the, the child was born of low birth weight, they were more likely to have coronary heart disease. And so what's happening in that nine months is not um, only for during that time, but also setting that baby up for life and prediction as to what kind of adult chronic diseases that child might have. Now, the reason why I mention that in the context of today is because obviously that is also for diseases of the brain. And once again, going back to um, impacts of what's happening in the pregnancy, having consequences later on, this chart looks at just a three month period in Holland um, in the post-World War II um, famine. And you can see that if that was during this period for this group of boys, they were more likely to suffer, have much greater risk of suffering schizophrenia, schizoid um, personality disorders or a central nervous system anomaly. So you can see that the there's, there's this terribly delicate balance of what's happening in this precious nine month period that is setting up for life, not just during uh, the time of the pregnancy. 
So now we have our major concern, not a post-World War II um, famine, but a significant concern in COVID-19. And what impact is it having on maternal mental health? Well, it's quite worrying. Um, and we've looked at studies that are looking internationally and there's a recent Lancet meta-analysis and systematic review showing very disturbing concerns on EPDS where mothers are indicating much poorer mental health compared with before the uh, pandemic and you're probably seeing this in your antenatal clinics. Statistically significant for postnatal depression and maternal anxiety or both and of course a statistically significant increase in the difference in from an equity perspective in those um, in lower and middle income countries. So the evidence is showing that whereas the EPDS score self-identified was 15% and that's what we've always quoted pre-pandemic, it's now looking where these studies have been undertaken at 40%. And it'll be interesting in the discussion whether you feel that that um, is what you're seeing as well. Um, and we're seeing a significant number of, um, of high anxiety, 30% before the pandemic versus 72% currently. So I'd be interested to hear in the discussion if that's your experience. Uh, because whilst these studies aren't of Australia, the National Child Health Poll did um, a study last year in July um, looking at self-reported uh, deterioration in mental health. This isn't in pregnant women, this is just in parents. And you can see that the parents, are 46% are saying that the COVID has had a negative impact on their mental health. So it, it makes me think about um, how we support women in pregnancy and and looking at it from a strengths-based approach. Um, at a recent conference, I heard an amazing presentation from a First Nations American man, uh, Dr. Yellowbird, and he talked about wellness in pregnancy and calmness in pregnancy. And it was the traditional Indian way that um, when women were pregnant, they were put in a separate place in the community, they were protected from sites such as the hunting and gathering, etc., and that they were tried to be maintained in, in a calm, happy, welcoming environment. And once again, I think that'd be interesting in our discussion to look at, at what are we doing to, to support women from, from that perspective. Okay, so we're now moving off to the second part of the evidence, um, B for the brain. Uh, but we're not moving from um, the antenatal period because I want to talk about um, some fabulous work that's happening with regard to um, giving information to mothers to go to full term and naming full term as 40 weeks. And this is a, a marketing campaign called Every Week Counts. We know for some time now that we have a significant number of um, mothers, families that are choosing for social reasons um, to have a planned Caesar or an induction. And this is um, figures from 2015. However, these are very recent figures that have just been released by the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare. It's looking at healthcare variation and it's looking at where there is no medical or obstetric indication to deliver. And you can see in New South Wales, that would be 51% that where there is no medical reason for an earlier birth. We know that the short-term risks of that are respiratory, which could lead to the baby ending, ending up in NICU or a special care nursery, but now, we've got good evidence that the longer term risks are on the cognitive development of that child and a higher risk of ADHD. So when people are planning 
to, um, with no clinical indication, but just a social indication to have an induction of pregnancy or a, a, a planned Caesar, that that is going to have a potential impact on that um, child. Um, this is the piece of, um, of uh, the brochure that is put out by Every Week Counts, um, emphasising that a third of the weight of the brain is formed in that last five weeks. So a third of the weight of the brain lasts five weeks of pregnancy. And that the ideal place for that to happen is in the womb, of course, unless there is a clinical indication. And so we're seriously not talking about that group. We are talking about um, where it's a, a, a decision. And I think that it's important that if people are making that decision, they need to have um, information about the potential impact of that on their child going immediately and into the future. Um, this is the, the night sky. I put that up for you to think of neurons um, and neurons not connected because uh, when a baby is born, only 50 trillion are connected, neurons are connected, determined by the genes from the parents. In the first years, those connections increase to a thousand trillion, determined by the baby's experience. And the baby's experience is in the main that primary caregiver or mother, father. So what's happening in that baby's life, in their immediate surrounds, is actually being part of how that baby's brain is developing. So we'll talk later about how uh, the general public generally thinks that the child's brain just grows. But in fact, the baby's brain is growing as a result of the experience that that child has with primary caregivers. So the pathways that will be formed are those that are the repeated predict experiences so they are strong, predictable, loving, attached experiences that will be the kinds of neural pathways that are being developed. If it's anger, aggression and DV, that's the kind of neural pathways that are being developed. And just look at this head circumference. Just look at how steep that curve is in the first year of life. And remember that how that brain is formed is actually as a result of the experience of the primary caregivers of that baby and how, and how steep that is later on. And um, as those of us in Sydney know with some of our building catastrophes lately, it's much better to build it right the first time so that those structures are at the best that they can be. Now, a lot of the information we know about brain development comes from the Romanian orphanage study and um, this was at the end of the Ceausescu regime in um, Romania. These um, children had, the regime was insisting women have extra babies for the state. Uh, the babies were placed in orphanages. Um, and when the, um, the regime fell, these babies were adopted to the UK and to Canada. And um, there have been longitudinal follow-up studies on those two groups of babies. And that's why we know that if these babies were um, adopted in the main past about eight months, then regrettably their outcome, as in um, completing school, having employment, was unlikely. The more likely thing is that these children didn't complete school uh, were not able to form relationships and often had a mental health diagnosis. Um, that's 80%. Uh, 20%, it seems, regardless, um, did well. Um, and that's 20% in the UK and Canada. So we have got this amazing capacity for resilience in 20%. But of course, we do our work for the 80%. And one day it'd be wonderful to know what is the difference um, in that different group? You can see the extreme neglect actually means that the brain doesn't develop. Uh, so this is an extremely neglected brain. So it's hard to talk about brain plasticity when extreme neglect means that the pathways are not formed because of um, lack of stimulation, as opposed to this healthy brain here. 
Um, and so this is, um, think about this from the context of a mother with extreme depression that mightn't have been recognised postnatally, who mightn't be able to provide her baby with the level of stimulation. I mean, these are extreme examples of PET scans, but I think it all adds to the picture of the importance of identifying maternal mental health, not only for the mother, but also for the baby so that that child has the best opportunity. One of the things that we found as a result of the Romanian orphanage study was that there are critical window periods for the brain in that they need to undertake um, the stimulation so that that part of the brain develops because after that period, then it shuts down. And no matter what you do, that was the time the brain would develop that part. And if it isn't offered, the sensation isn't offered at that point in time, then you lose the opportunity. Now, um, a simple example is vision. Um, as you can see here, that when we used to do school screening, well, the critical period has waned and you, there's no point in trying to fix the vision at this point um, because the child will never be able to see because the opportunity has closed. Whereas if we do step screening here, as we do, we are able to identify the cataract or whatever that might be stopping light coming to the brain, which stimulates the pathway connections, which stimulates the brain being able to see. It's got nothing to do, well, something to do with the eye, but it's actually these critical brain periods. Um, and something that um, struck me the other day, because when we brought in SWISH, we changed the age of fitting of hearing aids to four years to four weeks. And there was an expectation that then these children would have the best outcome possible. But um, as was pointed out to me, these children haven't had hearing in the previous nine months in the womb. Um, and so it's, it's all part of the richness of these sensitive periods for development. So as it is for language development, etc. So we have this opportunity in the first 2000 days to get everything that we would want for a child in their nurturing, secure environment so that they can learn, so that they can have the best opportunity for development. And indeed, a child's developmental score at just 22 months will be an accurate predictor of their educational outcome at 26 years. We've got linked data that proves this um, from the Australian Early Development Census that has been linked to NAPLAN. And so we find that the AEDC result done at school entry is uh, unchanged in the NAPLAN test done in primary school. And indeed, there's also linked data from the um, early planned birth uh, to AEDC as well. So you can see just how critical your role is in antenatal care for lifelong learning for children. And it makes sense because if you just look at this um, chart, which is a bit overwhelming, but it's just talking about when um, a disease appears, brain disease appears, but let's look at when the brain is being formed in that first 2000 days. So this is for life. Okay, so now we're on to C, childhood experience. We're only going to talk about one study. Um, and this was once again an adult clinician, Vincent Folletti, who couldn't understand why he had one group of patients who just didn't get better compared to another group. And he accidentally found out that one of these patients had been sexually abused as a child, which led to him meeting with Robert Ander at the CDC to send out a questionnaire, a retrospective questionnaire to 17,000 people who were uh, privately insured in San Diego to see what their um, experience had been in childhood in reference to child abuse. If you haven't had a chance to watch it, there's a 15 minute um, talk by Nadine Burke Harris, which explains it beautifully. And she's had more than five million hits with regard to people understanding how childhood trauma affects health across a lifetime. Now the score of known as the ACE score, the Adverse Childhood Experience score is out of 10. You get one for each of these experiences in the household, DV, substance abuse, mental illness, parental divorce, or a parent in jail. Three 
one each for emotional, physical or sexual abuse, and then two for neglect. The study found, and this has been replicated in many countries, that if your score is six or higher, the prediction is that you will die 20 years earlier from those who have a score of none. But ACEs are common. They are in the population at a fairly high prevalence. And the mechanism of um, early death is adverse experience, adoption of health risk behaviours or not, leading to disease disability and early death. And that um, has an impact that has been shown on the child in, um, in early impairment in being able to develop normally. And then you can see years later the impact. And the mechanism is toxic stress. Um, brief increases in heart rate is normal. We need that as part of our experience. Stress will occur for that child, but to have it buffered by a supportive relationship is important. We're talking about toxic stress where there's prolonged activation of the stress response system that sets that cortisol level up at extreme and long lasting with no buffering and easily triggered by minor um, upsets. So it totally changes that person's biochemistry so that when they first tie drugs in adolescence, they might feel calm for the first time in their life. So there's no point saying drugs are bad for you. Um, there's no point saying what's wrong with you. Far more appropriate to say what's happened to you. Now, this is particularly important with regard to um, maternity uh, because it's another factor as to what might have happened to the mother that uh, you are seeing and whether there'll be triggers there for her in relationship to this baby and in relationship to the pregnancy in that obviously if she's wired more for flight and fight, if you're giving bad news or, um, or the pregnancy is concerning, then she's going to go straight to that toxic stress level. In uh, Vancouver, they uh, give out the ACE questionnaire as part of their piloting, giving out the ACE questionnaire as part of antenatal um, care, um, in addition to a resilience assessment. And they don't find out how the mother gets her particular score. Uh, they come back and say, oh, I see you've got a score of five. However, on the resilience, you've got a good network of friends. And so they're looking at, at how um, they can use this as part of the developmental history to know more about the mother uh, during antenatal care. The other thing that we're doing now is piloting the pregnancy and a blue book because I think it will be important for us to document all of these things now for the lifelong um, outcomes for those children. Following on from this, of course, I don't need to say anything more about domestic violence in that everything that we've talked about explains how and why domestic violence is so damaging for babies. Um, mothers can inadvertently think, well, the baby's safe because it's in my womb. But of course, the baby's not safe if that mother is herself in flight and fright and fear and constantly at that high stress level because that baby is receiving that impact um, psychosocially, if not um, physically. And that, of course, is why, in addition to the um, antenatal and postnatal psychosocial assessment, we have domestic violence screening. OK, so now we understand the mechanism of the importance of the first 2000 days. We understand the anatomy, the biology, the chemistry, the data linkage. And if we understand that, we can understand the interventions. And with all of these, without a doubt, the most important one is attachment. And if you're in the room at this point, I'm hoping you'd all go, ah, at uh, this beautiful image of my dog, Bonnie, and I in mutual gaze. And um, what a privilege it is after um, a baby has been born in those wonderful first minutes and hours, having that wonderful opportunity of seeing attachment and skin to skin contact and the mutual gaze and that beautiful period and hopefully setting up attachment for life for that child. We have an issue with screens because that's breaking the mutual gaze. And um, we have got some posters trying to promote um, that 
switching off might be more important to, with the phone to switch on to your child. Um, and there are some great other resources that actually are demonstrating that whilst the child is in, in front of a screen, they're not getting any brain stimulation as opposed to um, a loved one's uh, carer's face, where if the baby does something, they do something and they get that replication and you can see their, um, their brains lighting up in, in beautiful pathways. We know attachment is used in neonatal nurseries in Scandinavia, where they have the skin to skin contact and those babies are often leaving NICUs much earlier. So in the final short segment, um, just to say what the first 2000 days is about, we've got a framework. There are three objectives. The first objective is that everybody understands how important the first 2000 days is, because if people know this, then they will understand what they need to do. However, we've got Australian research that shows, and I just show you this slide to show you the green as to how comprehensive this research was. And what they found is worrying because most people don't realize how important that primary caregiver, that person who loves that baby is in actually for that child's brain development. They think that the child's brain just grows. They find it hard to understand. They don't think a child can have any mental health issues that a baby could feel sad or anxious. And more worryingly, they think that child development doesn't really start until the child can speak. And as we saw earlier, 22 months, the child is set for um, our outcomes. What we say is important. If we say we want to do parenting programs, it's seen negatively. Parenting is seen a private matter. Whereas if we say we want to do something to promote child development, that's seen very positively. Now, maternity is most, mostly mentioned in strategic objective two where you can see those first two objectives are all about antenatal care um, and looking at evidence-based screening and assessment. And we've already started doing some work to promote father inclusive practice. In the baby bundle that you give out to parents when they leave the hospital, there's a flip chart because most people don't know what normal development is and don't know what to do. So this wonderful resource is called Love Talk, Sing, Read, Play because the only thing you've got to do is love, talk, sing, read and play. It's not complex um, and it's certainly not a computer program. We have issues at the moment in New South Wales because we have one in five children arriving at school developmentally vulnerable on at least one domain. And we are trying to do something about that with trying to get more people to get developmental surveillance um, and to attend our centres to um, get that kind of developmental assessment. Objective three is for the most vulnerable and the kinds of things I thought about from a maternity perspective would be pregnancy family conferencing, where we look at those who are so vulnerable and try to put as much in place antenatally as we would when that child is born. We've now developed the implementation strategy. We were delighted that the secretary released that implementation strategy. Um, everybody in local health districts need to report uh, back to the Ministry on how they're going. So in conclusion, you can see that this is important. The Duchess of Cambridge is now talking about how important the early years are, but probably even more so, this is an image from Facebook, um, which emphasises that when you are pregnant, you're also pregnant with your grandchild. So the work that you are doing is not just for this generation of children, but also for the next. And um, it always impresses me that we all have to do our resuscitation courses every year on airway breathing and circulation and defibrillator. And it's the likelihood of us using it is probably not great. However, if we looked at the ABCD of the first 2000 days, in particular, your role in antenatal care, the likelihood of you making a difference to lives is 100%. So um, thank you for your time today um, and I'm happy to take any questions that have occurred. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And I'm, I'm, I think I've got a real letter because I might pass to one of my colleagues. Joe, do you want to see if your letter is has that sending or am I necessarily too? 
What's the sound? It's fine. I can hear you. Yep. So thanks, Elizabeth. That was a fantastic talk. I really love the message there at the end about A, B, C, D and how you can really change 100% of lives. Such a powerful message. So we'd just like to open up now to see if there's anyone that's joined online that has any questions for Elizabeth. I've also popped something in the chat to ask for any questions, so you can pop them in there. Hi, Women. I'm wondering if you could share if you spoke about the switch off your device strategy. I was wondering if you could share how where we find that link or that information in the information in the value program. Sorry, I had trouble hearing that. Um, Is this any better? Um, do you want to write yeah. it in the chat? And then, can you pop it in the yeah. chat if that's all right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank okay. you. Sorry, we're having problems with sound today for some reason. Yeah. Resilience. Oh, okay. Um, so that. So thank you. So that's the um, work that is being. The, I referred to the work that I was aware of in an equality project that's happening in maternity services in British Columbia in Canada, um, and it was a, a a questionnaire that looked at what kinds of resiliences were in this woman's life, a strengths assessment. And yes, we are doing work on that at the ministry and would be happy to share that um, because it, it, it is important uh, for us to look at the strengths in a woman's life, not just the negatives. And in particular, when you're asking ACE questionnaires, um, I think that's important. Thank you. Elizabeth, and it's also popped in there. Do you have a link for the switch off your device promotion? Ah, uh, yes, I can send that through. Thank you. That was something we actually developed in my uh, local health district in Northern Sydney, local health district, and happy to do that. Yeah, um, I think that's one of the concerns, isn't it? And you know, when, when I did sort of first level psychology, one of the things that we learned about was frozen face. Like you've probably all seen that experiment between a mother and a baby, and then the mother just does a frozen face and the baby goes through a series of distress. If you have a look at any time in public transport where the mother sets the baby up and then goes on a phone, you see that baby going through those levels of distress. And what a missed opportunity of having that brain development and the interaction. Um, and that Bright Tomorrow Start Today, I would really recommend as an app because it demonstrates that it's the interaction between your face and the baby. And if you put a screen in between, either with you or the baby, then that's going to have a less than optimal outcome for that child. Ah, the, there's an excellent question about the ACE. Now, um, a lot of people are looking into ACE. Unfortunately, it's a victim of its own success and people have started looking at it as a screen and it was never developed as a screen. It was developed as a um, retrospective questionnaire um, and it doesn't meet screening criteria. Um, however, looking at having part of a full history, um, looking at whether someone has got a high ACE score is very important. Um, so yes, um, that's watch this space as far as that's concerned. Yes, Safe Start is being reviewed at the moment. Um, so thank you for that question, Bridget. We're looking at um, how ACE fits in there and looking at the broader psychosocial assessment. At recent conferences, there's actually been criticism of ACE because it's been so popular, people only think of that adverse childhood experience. They're not thinking about other things like loss of a parent or being a refugee. Um, and so um, we're looking at how important trauma is, but uh, we don't want it to be simplified to one questionnaire. We need to look at it more broadly. Um, and we can get back 
at we can get back to you about what pilots are happening and there are pilots happening with regard to the ACE questionnaire. So we, I, I'm happy to follow up on, as far as that's concerned. Thank you. I'm going to try and speak and hope that I don't get too much echo, Elizabeth, but I just want to like really say a huge thanks for you joining us today. For me, it really emphasises also the importance of our new maternal mental health um, mandatory training for all maternity clinicians. And mm -hmm. as we've heard you speak and, you know, the importance of recognising where there is deterioration, you know, for a mother and where that we can direct her and assist her to, um, you know, to get that treatment at the right time. Um, I remember looking at particularly your graph on the treatment of depression. And, you know, I know that many women will have like things like that misconception that it's better to not have medication. Um, and so, you know, some of these learnings we've put into our module, so it's informed it there, but it'll be really great. This is just the start um, for us in this space, in our mandatory space. Um, but, you know, we welcome um, your input into this today. I think it's been hugely complimentary. So I just thank you on behalf of everyone online. And um, thank yes. you. Yeah. Well, it's just it's. I, I think in a way we. I, I don't think we were all. I certainly wasn't so aware about how important the health of the mum's mental health was going to impact that future development for that child. And um, all of these studies are showing that. So no pressure for all of you. <laughs> no pressure, but we, no pressure. Can, we can do it. And, um, you know, I think like you said, you know, as maternity clinicians, you know, we can make that difference. You know, we yeah. can make a huge difference for the mother and also for the child. Um, so, you know, I think that's just been excellent. I don't know if anybody else um, online um, would like to add any other comments or if there's any other feedback that you want to leave for Elizabeth in the chat, we'd welcome that. Um, but it is coming up to three o'clock, so I'm going to um, say good afternoon to everyone. Thank you so much for joining our webinar. And once again, um, thanks to the CC team, but uh, most and thanks to all of you for joining us and most of all thanks elizabeth for so, an excellent presentation okay thank you